Hello, my name is Lauren Horton. I'm here at the Iowa City Johnson County Senior Center this afternoon and joining me is Michelle Buman and we're going to talk about one of the programs that's offered here at the Senior Center and in order to make sure that it's correct I'm going to read the description from the catalog. The program is called Death Cafe. There is no fee, there is no registration, it's open to anyone who would like to come and we meet once a month. A death cafe is a group of people who are not afraid to discuss and increase their awareness of death in order to make the most of life. The topics of our monthly discussions are determined by the members of the group. People are encouraged to bring snacks to share. It is not a bereavement support group nor a grief counseling session. And for more information, there is a web page to which they uh, can go if they have computers. So I think I will uh, now let Michelle give a little description of how Death Cafe as a national or international group uh, got started and so forth. Thank you, Lauren. So the Death Cafe was started in uh, September of 2011 and they have a website, um, www.deathcafe.com, and anyone can start a death cafe. It's a kind of a social organization, and it's, it's free. Um, they, you can get on their website and download a, a guide on how to, how to start one yourself. And uh, this came to my awareness about three years ago, and I thought, we should try it here at the Senior Center and, and see if uh, people would be interested in it. So I printed off the guide and, and went through it and put an advertisement in our program guide and, and off we went. So we've been in existence since the spring of 2015 and um, we have taken some time off, some months off, depending on uh, staff availability to run the, run the group. Um, but we have uh, been going monthly pretty consistently over that time and we have different people that drop in and everyone's welcome. There's no age requirement. Um, it's just a place where people can go and talk about death and with the idea that our lives are finite. And does that sound accurate to you, Lauren? That pretty well sums it up. There uh, is a never a surety about who is going to come to any of our meetings or how many will come. We've had uh, small attendance sometimes, a very large attendance at other times. Uh, we assume that everybody who comes is interested in it. Some come for curiosity because they find the name of the group somewhat, uh, well, unusual, I guess I would say. Death Cafe, they understand that we're going to talk about death. Uh, they are not sure where the cafe part comes in, but because it is a national group, and that's what it's called, that's what ours is called, too. Uh, usually the discussion is a matter of who wants to bring something up that they would like to talk about. And we have had a very wide-ranging uh, uh, cycle, I would say, a series of topics that they have uh, come up with or have brought forward. Michelle, why don't you uh, uh, mention some of the things that people have brought up that they really do want to talk about. Yeah, so I'm just going to go over the general topics because when people come to a death cafe, we want to ensure you know what they say during that time is confidential, mm -hmm. but um, you know there's been a lot of talk about the afterlife, mm -hmm. um, how we describe death, uh, the euph euphemisms of, of dying or passed away or kicked the bucket or we can go on and on on that. Um, some people's personal experiences with a family member that's died. Um, just to be clear, we don't offer uh, grief support. It's not a grief support group, but um, when people bring that up, it's usually in the light of them acknowledging their own um, finite existence. <laughs> and. You know, we've talked a lot about cemeteries and yep. burial rites and funerals and advanced care directives if you can't speak for yourself. 
um, you know, what are the processes and um, talked about just kind of some aging uh, issues within that text where um, people talk about they don't want to leave a whole bunch of stuff for their loved ones. So we, we kind of talk about downsizing a little bit and um, yeah, I don't know. There's probably some other topics well, that I'm not I, thinking of. Yeah, I was thinking that uh, sometimes uh, someone will describe the death experience of a loved one and in so doing they have learned what they hope will not happen if they die or they have found that certain things were comforting for them and they will know what do what they hope will happen when uh, their own death does occur. My own fields of research uh, involve the funeral customs, what is actually uh, done at the ceremony between the time of death and then the time of disposal of the remains, whether it be a burial or cremation. And I'm also very interested in how uh, people honor the members of their family or their friends after they have uh, died. I should pause here and say that I do not use any of the euphemisms for the word died. I find most of them unsatisfactory, but I have made a collection of them, and I think I have a collection of 74 different words or phrases that are used in place of saying somebody died. For that uh, very uh, purpose, I read obituaries uh, diligently, uh, and I'm always interested in how that particular uh, event is phrased. And even in uh, the Iowa City Press Citizen or the Cedar Rapids Gazette or the Des Moines Register, there may be six or eight different ways of saying that uh, in one issue, one issue in particular. I believe we had uh, at various times, people also talked about near-death experiences, did we not, mm -hmm. Michelle? Yes. Uh, you uh, probably should describe that better than I can. Well. Obviously, a near-death experience is when you are in a situation where they have um, your your heart stops beating and you feel like you're you know you're pronounced dead, but then you you're not actually dead. But through that uh, discussion, we were able to have a uh, a couple classes uh, here at the senior center. So we had different people with different expertise come in and uh, offer different classes and that was all because of the discussions within the death cafe itself so the near-death experience class was offered actually twice very popular class um, you offered a writing your obituaries class and we we had some other death and dying classes and and the reason these have come out of the discussion rather than keeping them within the death cafe itself is because the death cafe has no agenda there's no um, objectives or themes the discussion is um, really about what the people who come that time you know to that particular meeting want to talk about so um, we we've had people say well why don't you show this video or or read this article or something within the cafe and it's really not up to us to um, provide that kind of information we're not going to teach someone how to uh, arrange a funeral per se but those classes do come out as a as a result of the discussions and they end up in our catalog I think we've also offered uh, classes in the legalities of mm -hmm. uh, making, uh, I'm forgetting the exact words, uh, uh, medical uh, power of attorney for medical purposes. That's what I'm trying to say. That's the advanced uh, care planning process. Yes, advanced uh, planning and also uh, it is occasionally my feeling that we need to urge people to make sure they have a will. I'm not talking about a living will, I'm talking about a, a will. Uh, and there have been people in the Death Cafe who have talked about the complications that happen if a person dies without a will and then in the settlement of the estate and sometimes the 
conflicts that result amongst members of the family about that sort of thing. And yes, I did offer a class in writing, obitu uh, writing obituaries, writing your own obituary. And as a part of that, it was a two-part class. So one time I talked about the things I felt should be in an obituary and the kind of things that often are included in the obituary. And then the, in the latter uh, meeting, we talked uh, about our own people wrote obituaries, either for themselves or for a friend or a family member. And it, before we started, it was a little bit puzzling to me why anybody would need help in writing an obituary. I don't know that they actually needed help as much as they needed an impetus to start doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did uh, indeed, I think, find it interesting the obituaries that I presented as examples, both ones that I thought had been done, shall we say, appropriately, and those perhaps that had been done less appropriately. There's no right or wrong to that sort of thing. It's what you want to do. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other uh, things. We have had uh, presentations about uh, funerals or what happens after a member of a family uh, dies from various ethnic perspectives, too, have we not? Maybe uh, you can remember that better than I can because you're younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's because I put the programs together. <laughs> but, if, uh, but sticking with the, the topic of the Death Cafe uh, for the moment, um, we are always open to new members. Uh, anyone can come of any age. Um, it is once a month and uh, varies from month to month, uh, from catalog to catalog or, or uh, triannual program guide when it actually is occurring. This spring of 2018, it is occurring on uh, the first Thursday of each month at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on our second floor in one of our classrooms. In the summer, the schedule may be different, so just uh, refer back to our website or program guide for current listing of when that is taking place. Um, I said it was here at the Senior Center, and uh, the nice thing about this is that it is different every month. So you can come back over and over again, and it's never exactly the same um, kinds of conversations. And the conversations that are had, um, I find to be fantastic. I get a lot, personally, I get a lot out of it um, because people come from different perspectives and backgrounds. And one of the ground rules that we lay out at the beginning is that we hope everyone is respectful of the different backgrounds and perspectives and that no one is trying to convince someone that there's something right or wrong about what their opinion is on death or the afterlife or um, their religion or philosophy around that. And um, people have been great about having differences of opinions and sharing uh, their perspectives in a, in a kind way. And there's never been any confrontation. No one has ever um, been critical of someone else's opinion. And that is kind of rare kind in of society. Actually. And it's been, I think, um, helpful for me. And people, people can discuss things that they don't agree with in a very kind way. And that um, maybe the topic, uh, because it's death, but you know, we've had some students from the university come in and sit in on the class, and we've had international students. And I think that really adds a lot of um, quality to the class, uh, to the discussion, because that's even a more diverse background of people that come. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, a greater uh, breadth of topics than, mm -hmm. uh, that have been brought up. And I think I was present at the first meeting of mm -hmm. Death Cafe, and I've been at most of them since then. And it's just uh, always very interesting what is going to appeal to somebody or somebody describes something and that triggers somebody else to remember something. And one of the things that I prize about it is that although we would generally plan to meet uh, an hour 
it's not rigid. If nobody has anything to say, then it ends, and if we have more to say, it goes over a little bit. So it, it has that nice flexibility in it, too. And it's free. There's no cost uh, right. associated with it. Um, the reason why it's called a death cafe, the originators would bring in tea, coffee, and cake. But we have no budget, so I just, as you read in the description at the beginning, uh, we encourage people to bring something to share, and sometimes people do, and sometimes people don't. Uh, the discussion goes on either way, and uh, it's, it's really nice. So um, I'm always looking for volunteers to lead the group. I've been leading it um, for the last few years, and like I said, I get a lot out of it. But if there's someone out there who is inspired by this um, discussion and you want to uh, become a facilitator for that, then uh, let me know. And if you want to start one on your own, you can get online and, and check out their guide and, and start one. They, we really want to encourage these discussions to happen throughout the community so it's not just here at the Senior Center. Right. And it's kind of a self-generating thing. Uh, things, tangents, well, tangent sounds wrong, but sidelights come out of it, like the class on the writing of the obituaries, the class on the near-death experiences, or the presentations about that. Uh, it is free-flowing, and we have never yet had any problem getting it started. Somebody always has something to say, mm -hmm. and uh, when they say something it triggers, as I said before, somebody else to think about something like that, or one of their own experiences causes somebody else to have either a similar or a very different experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it just builds upon itself. And I think that the fact that some people are willing to talk more than other people are is in a sense a comforting thing because uh, you can tell sometimes that somebody is relating an experience and somebody else is nodding. Yes, they, they have experienced the same thing and I and they seem to be comforted by that, I think. Mm -hmm. Don't you? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And there's no commitment, you know, so uh, if it fits in your schedule one month, then show up and if it doesn't for a few more months, um, you don't have to worry about it. You can just come when you can. A drop in, and I think we have never had a session when no one came. We've had a small session. We've had a, small had a very one. small session. I think the smallest group we had was maybe four people, mm -hmm. and then we've gotten to a point where, in some of them, especially when we first started, were uh, bigger than the room would allow, and we were yes. probably breaking some code out there, but we survived. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> and yeah, just you just never know. It fluctuates from month to month. And I think the last month that we did that, we had uh, four new people show yes. up. And uh, mm -hmm. we love it when new people show up because that adds a new dynamic to the conversation. Right. And as I said at the beginning, they come for uh, various reasons. They may be curious about the name. Uh, they may have recently had a bereavement themselves. and. Uh, talking about it not in the sense of grief counseling or uh, uh, support of that kind, but it may be that they would like to tell somebody about the experience. And almost anything will bring about a reaction. If I talk about an inscription on a grave marker that I have found that's very interesting, that will inspire somebody else to talk about it inscription that they have found on a grave marker. Same way with funerals. Uh, it is uh, in the study of comparative funerals over time and in different places, different colors are worn for mourning and what somebody in 1890 wore to a funeral is not what somebody might wear to a funeral in 2018. So the, the actual clothing, uh, color, casualness, formalness has changed. Uh, obviously, we do not necessarily know what uh, religion 
whether Christian or uh, non-Christian or what denomination of Christianity the participants are in until they start describing something uh, about a funeral or about uh, uh, a minister or a priest coming to the home while the person was dying and that sort of thing. Every religion and every denomination have their own, I will call them ceremonies or liturgies that are done for funerals. But then there are people who are not religious at all and they still have a, a certain ceremony or a certain standard of, of behavior that they go through that. I think that the matter of our religious belief about the afterlife has very rarely come up. I don't remember that uh, being brought up at all, actually. But uh, how different churches and different denominations handle the funeral and the burial and that sort of thing has come up and has been described. It has not been, in, at least that I can recall, any time that anybody has introduced the subject of a religious belief as the point of departure for discussion, but it may enter in uh, after something else has been uh, discussed. And as far as the demographics of the people who come to the Death Cafe, it is hosted here at the Senior Center, so the majority of the people who attend are or older and have some have had some experience with death in their life and may be thinking about that a little bit more so um, than maybe a younger person because maybe they're closer to that and in recognizing um, maybe they're reaching the age that their parents had died and then that makes you think about their own death and that has been brought up in our death cafes but we really um, hope and encourage people of all ages to come to the senior center to the death cafe because those different ages and those different perspectives on death um, really add a lot to the conversation. Um, one, I, one of the things that surprised me the most when I started the death cafes is, is the humor and the laughter. And uh, that, you know, when you're talking about death, is I think an unexpected uh, part of those conversations. Uh, and it's because we're looking at it not as the death, but as every day is important and um, making the most out of our finite lives and so kind of getting back around to that and part of that there's humor. Yeah, it, it shows up quite frequently. Yes, the, the whole idea of uh, uh, death as a finality is not what we're about but the idea that we don't know when our death is going to occur and so it behooves us to enjoy every day that we are alive in every way that we can. That's, I think, one of the strongest points in Beth Cafe. Now, there are some people who say that, well, nobody cares about me. Uh, I think that is never true about anyone. So think of an obituary as being a work in progress, and your own feelings about things change over time, and what you think is important when you're 40 may not be what you think is important when you're 80. But if you have the framework, and I offered the people in the class what I thought was a, a framework, the very minimal amount of information that should be covered, I think that you would definitely should have, now this is my opinion, definitely should have the full name of the deceased person. You should have a certain amount of chronological framework when they were born and when they died, and a certain amount of geographical orientation where these two events occur in the birth and the death. After that, it's, it's sort of up to the individual. At the end, though, if the funeral has not occurred, there should definitely be a, a 
an announcement of when that event is going to take place. One of the materials you offered in the, in the class that was pretty interesting to me was the uh, list of euphemisms for, for death, and I, it was a rather long list. I'm not sure it seemed to take up most of a page. I uh, have been collecting obituaries that I think are interesting for many years. I have a, a very good friend in Washington, D.C., who does the same thing for East Coast newspapers, and we exchange them. Uh, there is a category of people who say that so-and-so died. And there are a category of people who want to use a euphemism, I'll call it that, or a phrase that has softened that a little bit. And they will say that they somebody passed away or passed or crossed over or uh, things of that sort. And those who are very, very religious will have an expression, they have gone to be with the Lord, uh, they have gone to be in heaven, uh, that sort of thing. But then there are the people who do it in a very individualistic way, and uh, uh, sometimes obituaries are written in first person, and it will say that I uh, left this earth on such and such a day, and give the date and so on, go on in first person describing everything. I did this in my life, I did that in my life, and so on. There's really uh, almost no uh, limit to what some people will do. If uh, a person does not give any attention at all to writing even an outline of an obituary, and they die, somebody very likely is going to have to write that and that's going to be a burden upon this person. It may be on the person's children, it may be on the person's siblings or whatever, but it's a burden if they have no idea of what the deceased person really wanted. So I think it's a, a kindness to your family and to your friends if you at least give them a framework on which to go. I should be remiss also if I uh, don't remind you that there are occasionally factual errors in obituaries. Sometimes it's a misprint of a date. Uh, in fact, I have a, one obituary from a very long time ago where somebody was born in 1848 and died in 1842. Well, that's, so a little bit of information, the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why are uh, good rules for journalism and they're good rules for obituaries too. Well, thank you, Lauren, for uh, taking part in this video today.